All right, it's seven o'clock and I appreciate everybody tuning in. Thanks for joining into the Greenville Zoo's conservation lecture series that we're starting up again. Uh, with this virtual format, it's a great way to get more people available to attend given the logistics of trying to go to an in-person lecture. We in the past had had in-person lectures, but uh, due to COVID, we had some challenges obviously. And now we do not have a venue where we can do in-person lectures, but are searching to identify one. And uh, once we do, we may do a hybrid of some in-person lectures and some Zoom lectures. Uh, this lecture is being recorded so we can make it available at a later date and we'll get word out when, when that's occurring. Uh, we uh, will have a question and answer period when we're done with the lecture portion of the, the program. And our lecture today is on Red Panda conservation and the work that Red Panda Network is doing to promote Panda, red panda conservation and habitat preservation in range countries, uh, that being Nepal. So we we just had the celebration of International Red Panda Day uh, a couple weeks back. And this presentation fits really nicely. We have two young red pandas that um, have joined the zoo and are part of the SSP for red panda. So we can assist as a as an AZA Zoo and Red Panda sustainability up efforts. Our speaker today is the Deputy Director of the Red Panda Network. He's been with the Red Panda Network since 2013 and holds a degree in conservation biology. He first became aware of Red Pandas in high school and had a, was sort of surprised by them. He may add that into his his lecture and uh, explain how that that came to be, but he's had a had a strong interest in red pandas and been able to see them in their natural habitat. And it's my pleasure to introduce Terence Lee as our speaker this evening. Thank you so much, Nicolay, and uh, thank you to the Greenville Zoo for having me. This is such a pleasure. Um, I love talking about red pandas and about the the work that we do to uh, to save them. So, yeah. Um, so the name of my presentation is "Saving the Last of the First Panda," and I'll get into why the the presentation is named that um, as I as I proceed to the lecture to the lecture. So this is what I'm going to talk about. And these are two young red pandas in the uh, the Panchtar Elam Tablajan corridor in eastern Nepal. So this place, it's very special. Um, it's actually where we first started doing our conservation work. And um, we are in the process of, of establishing it as a um, community protected corridor. Um, it's the uh, westernmost part of, of Red Panda Range in Asia. Um, and it's very threatened and there's not a lot of red pandas remaining there still. Um, so we've prioritized it as an area of, of urgency for conservation. I'll also talk more about this, uh, the, the PIT corridor as well. So yeah, um, red pandas are the first panda. They are not actually related to giant pandas and were discovered uh, actually about, I think it's 48 years before uh, giant pandas. Um, so red pandas are unique. So backing up a little bit, if if I had like 30 seconds with someone, like an I guess an elevator pitch uh, is, is what people call it, uh, about, you know, why, why should I care about red pandas? Like why red pandas? I would be like, well, they're unique. 
they're important and they're endangered. And that's basically um, sort of what I'm going to highlight right now. So there's no species like them. Um, they are in their own family, Alertidae, and they're the only um, extant member of their family. So all other all other members of Alertidae are now extinct. So the last remaining species. So you can kind of probably understand why it's it's so important for us to to um, protect them. They're also important. Um, and I, I already kind of mentioned why they're important. Um, you know, again, the only living member of their family. Um, but they're also on a on an ecosystem level, they've been identified as an umbrella species, a uh, flagship species, and an indicator species. So uh, an umbrella species, also also uh, called a landscape species, is an is an animal that when you conserve them, you're conserving all other animals in their area. So it's usually it's typically a larger animal. Um, so, you know, you can think of a tiger, an elephant, any sort of large animal that has a, a bigger range. Uh, when you protect those species, you're also protecting all the other often smaller, maybe less, um, you know, species that get less attention, public attention for conservation. Um, but red pandas are interesting because they're not a large species. I mean, they're, they're about the size of a, I mean, I guess a very large house cat. Um, I've seen photos of some house cats that are enormous. So, so they are, they can be about the size of a house cat um, or more like the size of a raccoon. Um, but their conservation has larger, a larger impact um, because they do have a, a larger range for a smaller species. Um, so when you're, when you're protecting them, you're also protecting all the other animals that they share uh, their Himalayan habitat with. And they are a flagship species, which means basically that um, although a smaller animal, you know, they are, um, they're sort of an ambassador of, of the, um, the Eastern Himalayan forests. So they have become more popular and more people are um, wanting to protect them. So they kind of represent this very important uh, habitat, this ecoregion, which has been identified by the World Wildlife Fund as one of the 200 most important uh, ecoregions in the world. So um, it's very important for not only wildlife, but also for people. Um, so as that sort of ambassador, that flagship species of this area, it's, it's very important that we conserve them. Um, and then, Lastly, as an indicator species, basically because they are a specialized animal, um, you know, they only, they only mostly eat bamboo, uh, about 98% of, of their diet is bamboo. Um, they are very affected by changes in the environment. So when red panda populations are doing well, it's usually an indicator that the um, ecosystem is doing well. Um, you know, that there's bamboo in the area, that there's, there's um, you know, old growth forest, that, that the ecosystem is intact and healthy. When there aren't red pandas around, it's usually an indicator that there's not um, a, you know, an in intact forest, that it's actually fragmented and um, degraded. And so, yeah, so, you know, very, um, very critical species to conserve. This is their range in Asia. It's a very old map, as I'm sure you can see. And sadly, they are an endangered species. Um, they are, uh, there are as few as 2,500 remaining in the world. Um, so that that's, uh, you know, not a lot. <laughs> and um, our, our estimates show that there are at least less than 10,000. They are a difficult species to monitor um, as far as their population. 
uh, because they are a very elusive species and because they live in very high altitude, um, you know, they're arboreal. So, uh, and they're very good at camouflaging, uh, which you might not expect with their red coat, but um, I've been in their habitat and it's very difficult to see them. So um, they are uh, an elusive species that's difficult to monitor. So that's part of what we're doing as an organization is, is um, you know, gathering data and learning where they are to understand the health of their population. Yeah, and um, this sad fact is um, that we have lost half of our red pandas in 20 years. Um, and the PIT corridor that I mentioned uh, in the beginning, that is their westernmost range uh, in Asia, and it is very threatened by deforestation and and poaching. Um, so again, that that's where we're really emphasizing our conservation work. So what is threatening them? As I mentioned, uh, habitat loss and poaching are the, the I'd say, the, the main threats to, to red pandas, although deforestation habitat loss is definitely the, the um, priority uh, or primary threat to, to um, red panda survival. Um, basically, where they live, there's uh, unfortunately a lot of poverty. Um, the, the local communities are what are, what are called forest dependent. So they rely on, on forest resources to survive. Um, you know, that includes timber for obviously, you know, their homes, their herding shacks, um, fuel wood, you know, to obviously cook and stay warm, fodder for their livestock, um, NTFPs for other livelihood needs. Um, and bamboo as well. So, you know, these communities obviously have to rely on the forest to survive. And as the population continues to grow, uh, human population, this obviously puts a lot of pressure on the forest and um, and leads to, uh, you know, forest uh, um, degradation and, and uh, forest loss, which obviously affects uh, red pandas. And another interesting uh, sort of factor in all this is just kind of the the odd um, nature of bamboo. So as I mentioned, ninety eight percent of red pan of the red pandas diet is bamboo, but the, these um, plants have a very interesting life cycle. So what they do is they after they establish themselves, they'll sort of do this mass bloom, um, and it, it happens every so often, and then they then they all die off. So because red pandas are so dependent on bamboo, when um, when they, they have these die offs, they have to kind of, you know, the red panda will have to move on to another area to find bamboo where, you know, that isn't dead. And so when the forests are fragmented, they can't go to these other areas. And so that can result in starvation. Um, and also, you know, other threats. Um, Obviously, when there's, you know, when they're crossing areas where there's no trees, you know, in more developed areas, that makes them vulnerable to, um, you know, poaching, to, free, you know, feral uh, dogs, free roaming dogs, um, to cars, uh, you know, um, all those sort of uh, threats. So, as I, as I said, um, we mostly work in Nepal. We're, we're also beginning to work in Bhutan as well. And this is the uh, red pandas, um, at least their potential habitat in Nepal. So these are areas that either we have confirmed red pandas are there or areas where we believe there are red pandas based on, uh, based on data. And um, yeah, so uh, poaching is a threat to red pandas. Uh, mostly what happens is as red pandas are impacted by deforestation, as their population decreases, those populations become vulnerable to other threats, um, including poaching. So if you kind of imagine, you know, there's this, 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 you know, healthy intact forest, and as human encroachment kind of chips away at, at the forest, it creates what's, what's called these habitat islands. And, um, you know, basically, which is fragmented forest. And 
as um, as these habitat islands, you know, become smaller and smaller, basically that allows you know poachers or um, just local people who are who are just you know um, relying on the forest for NTFPs and other resources. Um, it it kind of just allows access to core red panda habitat more easily. So it basically makes their you know core habitat more accessible, um, which obviously makes them more vulnerable. So an interesting thing about poaching with with red pandas is that they're not. Um, it's sort of a complex situation. So this article by Munga Bay um, basically revealed that there's not really a demand for red pandas, and basically what's fueling red panda poaching is misinformation. Um, basically, misinformation that red pandas are worth something on, you know, on the, in the, the um, illegal market. I'll talk about that more a little bit later, but yeah, it was a really um, interesting discovery and it, it really helped us to alter our approach to anti-poaching. Um, you know, basically it, it helped to uh, help shape our um, outreach campaign that basically combats misinformation and lets people know that there is no um, value that red panda, you know, pelts and tails and, and, you know, whatever, or, or as pets, that there is no demand for that. And it's not worth the risk because, you know, they are a, a nationally protected species and it's illegal to, to hunt them or capture them. Okay. So now my favorite part, this is what we do to save them. And we have a, we have a community based model, which basically means that we all of our programs, um, you know, involve and benefit the local people. So, I mentioned earlier, kind of um, you know where red pandas are located in Nepal. So this information was based on a survey that we did in 2016, where we went out to all you know basically all these forest districts in Nepal. And through monitoring and through community surveys and, you know, all of these efforts, we, we found out where red pandas either are or potentially are. And these are the districts. And we work in a lot of these. And I'll show you where we work exactly. Uh, so like I, like I said earlier, we um, began in... Um, the PIT corridor, so the, the Panchtar, Elam, Tablajung districts here in um, far eastern Nepal. It's right on the Indian the border with India. And then we expanded to these districts in western Nepal. And then we recently, um, I sh this should say expanded because we've actually been there for about a year now, to uh, these three districts in uh, eastern Nepal. And this is basically how our, our community-based work is sort of, you know, organized. So we do research and monitoring. We uh, do, you know, we have sustainable livelihood programs, community-based conservation programs, policy and advocacy, and uh, education and outreach. So I'm kind of, I'm basically going to just kind of go through the progress that we've made over the last 16 years. Um, that's how long we've been an organization. Uh, we were founded in, in uh, 2007. So um, yeah, so that's basically how my uh, presentation is is organized. Hey, Terrence, one second. I just want to remind the participants that if you do have questions, use the Q&A feature and uh, submit your questions and then I'll I handle the questions to uh, Terrence at the completion of the, the lecture. Sorry for interruption. Thank you. No problem. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so in 2017, we created the world's first community-based red panda monitoring system. Uh, it's called uh, Punde Kundo. And these are our forest guardians. Um, I'm going to talk more about them. They are, we, we call them the heart of our community-based conservation work. Um, they're amazing. There's this fantastic film called the uh, the Firefox Guardian, and I don't know if anyone here has seen it, but if you haven't, um, uh, it features this this um, person Manuka, who uh, 
was our first female forest guardian. It is our fem first female forest guardian uh, in Nepal. It's a fantastic film. I definitely recommend it. it it's by a, a person named uh, Gunjan Manon, who is a fantastic wildlife um, filmmaker. And these are many of our other forest guardians. Uh, we currently have 128, which is um, pretty exciting considering we started with like eight. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's 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 really been a it's been a very successful program. Um, it's probably the program I like talking about the most. Uh, it's just it really changes lives, and it we couldn't do the work that we do without these um, conservation heroes. 2007, we we began establishing the PIT Red Panda Protected Forest, which is the first community protected area dedicated to red pandas. And I've been there, and it's a it's a beautiful place. That's unfortunately very threatened. Um, so yeah, in 2010, we launched our uh, basically our our forest guardian program. Um, this is a forest guardian who is looking at a, a red panda looks like a latrine tree so red pandas um basically go to the bathroom in one tree um so what other what, whatever red pandas are around they all use basically one tree and it's called a latrine tree so that's um so that's actually a, one of the ways that we um understand you know how many red pandas are in the area and how we find red pandas So, yeah, I mentioned the survey before. Um, we recorded red pandas in 23 districts. So we're currently working in, in 13. So we're over halfway to working in all of Nepal's red panda range. Um, in 2018, we began working in Western Nepal. Western Nepal is a very rural, I mean, all, all of this, all these areas I'm talking about um, are very rural, but Western Nepal, um, you know, it's not near Kathmandu. It's not really near any more developed, um, you know, cities or anything. So um, basically, you know, this area, this, this was the first conservation work um, really done in these areas. So it, it was very, it was um, very exciting and very important that we uh, expand our work there. So this was a huge uh, achievement. We worked with the government um, of Nepal in uh, developing this, what's called a Red Panda Conservation Action Plan and a uh, five-year plan. And basically, um, so it was the first of its kind in, in Nepal. And we use this plan to guide our work uh, there. And in 2018, we uh, launched uh, our, basically our anti-poaching initiative. It's called No Panda Poaching. And we now have uh, 12 anti-poaching networks uh, in Nepal. And this is, um, this is one of the anti-poaching patrol units, which is made up of local stakeholders, including forest guardians. Um, here's a forest guardian. And the other, uh, the other people on these patrol units are often uh, members of like community groups. So we, we work with what are called community forest user groups. And they basically, they basically manage community forests. And a lot of Nepal is um, community forests. So, or a lot of the forests are um, managed as community forests. Um, some of it's national forest, but a lot of it is community forest. And so these, these uh, CFUGs, um, these user groups, they they manage them so we work with them and um you know some of their members are involved in other ways too including uh these anti-poaching units so a big part of our anti-poaching initiative was working with uh dahong rai who is a very popular celebrity in nepal well globally but he's from nepal he's actually he's from red panda habitat and one of one of the ways he's really helped us is just with outreach with, like I mentioned, with our um, our campaign to combat misinformation. Uh, so this is like one of this is one of the posters that we um, we distributed in uh, in local communities, basically saying that, you know, 
red pandas really have no value and that it's not really it's not worth the risk to um to capture or poach them and so we also worked with the government of Bhutan to help them establish their first five-year red panda conservation action plan. Um, so yeah, now we've done it in two countries. Um, you know, very very pivotal um, achievement. Uh, you know, again, Bhutan uh, never had an action plan like this before, so it was a very um, very important thing to to do. Um, and then we conducted a mammal survey in 2019. So, um, you know, the, we one of the ways we monitor red panda ha habitat is we install camera traps, and uh, you know, we not only get photographs of red pandas, we also get photographs of of the other um, St. Patrick species that are located there, including uh, this this cute uh, marbled cat, which. Um, yeah, th that's right. This is the the first photographic evidence of this very endangered cat in Nepal. Um, so, and and um, it, it's cool. We uh, we also photographed another very uh, rare species um, in red panda habitat in Nepal, which I'll get to. So this is really exciting. We completed the construction of the Himalayan Habre Center um, this year. And this is the world's first center, basically, uh, in support of sustainable livelihoods um, for local people in red panda habitat. I got to visit this spectacular place and be there for its opening on Earth Day. Um, yeah, so we we lead eco trips there. Um, there's trainings there for local people to, um, you know, support their support their livelihoods. Um, it gives them access to improved technologies. Um, you know, it's a meeting uh, venue for, um, you know, like the community forest user groups and other community groups and, and agencies and stakeholders, basically to, you know, help bolster conservation efforts in the area. In 2019, we launched Plant a Red Panda Home. I, it probably feels like I'm breezing through these. Um, I There's, we do a lot, so <laughs> there's a lot, lot to cover, but I, I'll try not to spend too much time on each slide. Um, so... Yeah, this is a really exciting program. You know, we work with local people to plant trees and restore habitat. Basically, um, this is because, you know, because there's been so much deforestation in this area, um, you know, it's so it's not only important for us to work with local communities to protect the areas, but it's also important for us to restore the areas that have already been deforested. Um, so, you know, th the the goal is to restore these areas and help create this um you know biological corridor this forest corridor um, that connects these you know the habitat islands that i was talking about before um so red pandas have uh intact um you know uh forest to to live in so i mentioned before uh there was another species that was photographed we actually photographed a bengal tiger in in red panda habitat in uh nepal uh eastern nepal which was very surprising because um you know we didn't even know bengal tigers you know were uh living at this altitude um so this is the first photographic evidence of bengal tigers living at this elevation um in eastern nepal so it was a very um <laughs> a very exciting uh discovery Speaking of discover, uh, exciting discoveries, or uh, exciting, I guess, at least, we uh, we had the first uh, GPS collaring study um, in Nepal where we successfully equipped 10 wild red pandas with GPS satellite collars. Uh, again, this had never been done before, and it, it's provided a lot of information on, um, you know, uh, red panda population and um you know the, their behavior just just all this information that's really helped guide our conservation programs and one of the, one of the ways that we uh, restore habitat through our plant a red panda home campaign is we actually we actually purchase private land so that that's one of the ways that we um 
you know, that, that's part of this uh, part of this campaign is to actually purchase land and then restore it. And this is um, one of the areas that I got to visit when I was in Nepal uh, this last time. And and this is actually a uh, what, what we call a forest conservation nursery. So this is where um, we grow native plants and trees that are then planted in red panda habitat. And it's managed by what we call nursery guardians, who are local people that we hire to, to take care of these uh, saplings. And a lot of these species are, you know, red panda food species, um, you know, trees that they, they like to live in, um, all native species and all, you know, very, um, the, the very accurately represent the local forests. Um, yeah, this is just sort of some of our metrics um, for the Plant Red Panda Home campaign. Uh, in 2021, we launched uh, what we call the Economic Empowerment for Women campaign. Um, so in, in especially in rural Nepal, uh, women are unfortunately, uh, the, their lives are very limited by gender inequalities. Um, and so we, um, we've initiated uh, different programs, different sustainable livelihood programs, including our Forest Guardian program that help bolster their livelihoods and give them opportunities, um, you know, in, in areas like conservation, research, um, and just other sustainable livelihood programs that just help, um, help with, with gender equality. Um, we published some of the, of our findings from our Red Panda Color study. Um, and as I said, it, you know, it really provided a lot of insight into, um, their behavior, their threats, and basically kind of what what they do to survive, which was also really interesting. Um, and also, I, there's a, a big typo there. Um, as far as I know, strategies is not a word. So um, uh, I need to fix that. And our um, awesome program coordinator, who actually, I, I, I need to update this, this presentation because he actually has a new um, title now, but he, uh, in 2022, he won a, a Whitley Award, um, which is a very prestigious award. And I mean, he, Sonam Tashilama absolutely deserves it. He's um, he's such a pioneer for red panda conservation. Oh, so this is um, basically some of our, our achievements in 2022. Um, it's a really short video. Yeah, so I'll basically end on this press release that we, um, this is actually a few years, a couple of years old, but um, we uh, basically through our habitat monitoring that a lot of it is conducted by our forest guardians and, and other local stakeholders that we, that we partner with, um, you know, the, the, the data that we gathered showed that red panda numbers are improving. Um, in areas that were working. So in areas that were, were collaborating with local communities, um, red pandas are 
um, they're thriving. I mean, their, their, their population is improving. So um, this was obviously uh, an important uh, discovery and obviously very encouraging for, um, you know, our work and also just the global red panda population. Um, so hooray. And yeah, um, I uh, appreciate you letting me uh, talk about our work and red pandas. And I guess now we'll uh, we'll go to questions. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Terrence, for that. It's very inspirational and great to see all the all the benefits from Red Panda Network's uh, work in range countries for the Red Panda. I've got. A uh, number of questions. I'll start in uh, in um, in order of the questions being submitted. First is why are there why is there a fake demand for the pandas if they are not in high demand? Yeah. Um, basically. Basically, it's misinformation. Um, so we're not exactly sure why it exists. I mean, you know, obviously with with any sort of misinformation, um, we're not always sure where its origins are, but we just know that it exists um, and that uh, it exists in a way that is influencing local people to engage in risky behavior um, and, and harmful behavior, such as poaching. But as far as why it exists, um, I mean, there could be, a, it, it, it's probably a pretty complicated reason um, or a, a complicated number of reasons. But um, yeah, basically we just know it exists, um, but not exactly sure why. Okay. Uh, the next question is a participant is currently doing, uh, is studying for a zoology degree and they would love a career researching red pandas. Do you have any tips on how to get into this career? Ooh. Um, I mean, I would definitely recommend, I mean, obviously working at a zoo um, is a uh, a great resource uh obviously you know like um like for example greenville zoo you know is one of our conservation partners um so you know a lot of a lot of zoos nowadays are very connected with conservation groups like us um so that can be a really great way to um you know, develop your career and, and also, you know, organizations like us do offer internship opportunities, um, in, in the range countries. So that is something that we have done before. Um, we don't always have opportunities for that, but we, we do sometimes. Okay, great. And uh, the next question is when these islands collapse, is this known in real time? If so, is there any rescue plan to try to rescue humanely capture the red pandas before they die off or is it only discovered after it is over with um huh it's a that's a good question i mean basically you know the goal is to not have these entire areas to be deforested um, so we, we don't do, we don't do rescue. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons why, um, you know, organizations won't typically capture a wild animal regardless of the situation. Um, but, um, we, you know, basically our approach is, is protection, um, collaboration with local people and, you know, restoration as well. But, um, you know, like, like, for example, our forest guardians, like they, they monitor these areas, um, including these fragmented areas, um, these habitat islands. And, you know, when there is new encroachment, um, you know, new destruction, they, you know, 
we will intervene if, if it's possible. Like we will work with, you know, local, um, you know, community groups, you know, like I mentioned the community forest user groups, um, you know, so, so we will, we'll also use like policy and advocacy, um, ways to try to prevent and try to, to mitigate, um, these sorts of, these sorts of threats. Um, but we don't, we don't do like rescue, um, like efforts or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Which red panda species is more threatened, the Chinese red panda or the Himalayan? That, that's a great question, and and I I'm impressed that that you know that there's two species of red pandas. So um, that that is you know that has that has been a recent discovery. Um, it used to be that there were two subspecies, and now there, um, you know there there are two species now, and. Um, that's a good question. I'm actually, I'm actually not sure. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunately something I, I, I don't know, but, um, but great job at knowing that there's two species. <laughs> okay. Um, question, do you, this is from, from me on the two species. Do you know what, uh, the scientific name is for the two, how they differ in identification? Yeah, so the one behind me is the, uh, and the one right here is the, um, that's the Himalayan red panda. So that's that's the red panda that we, um, you know, work to protect. And that's um, Allurus ful fulgens fulgens. And then the other one is uh, Stiani, uh, Allurus fulgens Stiani, I believe is the um, oh, okay. sp species name. So, okay, yeah, that, that's the Chinese red panda. Okay, no, that's good to know. Um, question is how you can, how can you expand to more districts? Um, so we basically, we're, we're kind of always in the, the process of, um, seeing where there's opportunities for us to expand. You know, I, when you, when you have a community-based approach, you you want to you want to expand into areas where, um, you know, there's opportunities to work with the local people, and so that that's how we've kind of, so, you know, we we've learned where red pandas are, and we're learning where red pandas are, you know, most vulnerable, where where they're threatened, um, and so we obviously prioritize those areas, and we want to work in areas where. Again, there's opportunities to work with local people and, you know, support their livelihoods um, in ways that promote conservation. Um, so replicating the, that model um, sometimes takes, it, it always takes time um, because we want to do it in a way that's sustainable um, and respectful for local people. Um, so basically that's what we're always in the process of doing so the goal is to um you know continue to expand the, this uh uh these programs into into other ripanda um areas okay uh next question it ties into the two species again there seems to be more chinese red pandas in most of the instagram type footage out there rather than himalayan um uh, are they both represented in the species survival efforts in zoos and in the wild? Um, yeah, I really don't know much about the, the, um, Stiani, the, uh, the other red panda, the, the Chinese red panda, um, because we don't, we don't work, we don't currently work in areas where they live. Um, so I can't really speak too much about them. Um, they are both represented in zoos. As far as I know, most red pandas that you see, at least in the States, and I could be totally wrong, but I'm pretty sure a lot of them are the Himalayan red panda. Um, but yeah, I know there are also Stianis, um, cause I've seen photos of them, but yeah. I mean, you all at the Greenville Zoo probably uh, know, know better about that than I do. <laughs> 
we're we're involved with the Red Panda SSP in regarding uh, sustainability efforts. I honestly would have to see to what degree of depth uh, the species is being managed. That's a, a mm -hmm. great question and something mm -hmm. I'll I'll look into and see what I can I can find on our end. Yeah, that is a good question. Yeah. Uh, we got a few more questions. If uh, you're okay with time, Terrence, um, yeah. How do they live so high as far as their altitude? Um. So I mean, basically everything about them um, makes them live very proficiently in, in in these high altitude forests. So obviously they're very dense fur. So they actually have. Um, hair and fur, so they have like multiple layers, um, including on on the bottoms of their feet. Um, you know, during certain times of the year, uh, it gets very very cold um, where they live, and so you know when they're stepping on these icy branches, it helps them not slip and it helps keep them warm. Um, they are very good at conserving energy. Um, you know, th they they do sleep a lot. They're um, you know, they're not like koalas. They're not like that extreme where they're like basically always asleep. Um, but I love koalas, but, um, but they do sleep like 18 hours a day. Uh, they've been known to sleep like 18 hours a day. So, um, they're, they're what's known as crepuscular. So they're awake, you know, during the dawn and dusk. Um, so, you know, th they're basically awake during the warmer times. Um, and they, um, you know, their metabolism, I mean, they, you know, bamboo does typically grow very abundantly in these areas, um, which is, you know, probably why most of their diet is um, bamboo, even though bamboo is very low in nutrition. And it's not it's not the best. Um, uh, again, another similarity with koalas where their 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 food preference isn't um, ideal in a lot of ways. But um, anyway, yeah. So, you know, they they um, you know, they go into what, what's called torpor, which is a type of um, basically hibernation, um, especially during the cold winter months. So they'll basically like, you know, the lower their, um, you know, the respiratory rate, their heart rate, um, similar to when like a bear or another animal goes into hibernation, um, which helps conserve their energy, you know, when food is scarce, when the, the weather is, um, you know, challenging. Um, so, I mean, yeah, basically, you name it. I mean, they're they're built for the this high altitude, um, you know, forest life. So, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I could basically talk about that for a long time. We um, we have a, I think we have a couple articles on our website about just sort of like, you know, why they're such a specialized animal, um, you know, for these high altitude environments. Oops, sorry, I had myself muted. <laughs> what ways can ever what in what ways can everyday people get involved in helping the red panda? Um, I mean, you know, tell your friends about red pandas. There's still a species um that'll, you know, there's still a lot of people that don't really know much about them. Um, you know, they've obviously recently got a little more popular because of turning red and you know, because they are in zoos and 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 things like that, but um, you know, just tell your friends, tell your friends about the work we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're the world leader in red panda conservation. Um, you know, so, so basically, um, and, you know, obviously make sure people know that they're, they're not pets, you know, uh, so th there has been a demand for red pandas as pets that, that, that is a, a thing, unfortunately. Um, and so, uh, you know, some of the, the, uh, information that we do, you know, try to highlight is that red pandas are great, but they're not pets and they wouldn't make good pets. So, um, you know, tell your friends about red pandas um, and that they don't make good pets and that we need to save them, basically. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, let's see. Do you more we have a lot of great resources on our website too, you know. Okay, and out of the, the website, I'll put a plug in. The website is very helpful and has a ton of information how has media like disney's pixar turned red 
turning red affect the conservation efforts? Is it helping or harming the red panda? Yeah, so we um, we actually partnered with uh, Disney Pixar um, uh, sort of, you know, in um, in sort of unison with the release of that film. Um, or it was coordinated uh, during the release of that film. And they um, supported our work um, with a with a uh, donation, which was fantastic. Um, and they've they've supported us in the past as well. And I think it's I think it's helped just because um, I think you know part of part of the the struggles with red pandas is that they're just not they're they're just not as you know popular as some of the more sort of megafauna. Um, you know, like tigers and and giant pandas. Even you know, giant pandas are still, I think, a lot more popular than red pandas. Um, even though they're the endangered, you know, panda, they're they're a very endangered animal that still, um, you know, still uh, needs to get um, some public attention. So I think it, I think it really helped. Yeah. Okay, that's encouraging to hear. How does red panda poaching compare to the poaching of other species such as rhino? Uh, that's a really good question. So, yeah, you know, like I mentioned before, uh, misinformation really fuels red panda poaching. Um, it's interesting, though. Uh, red pandas used to be uh, poached or um, hunted uh, because local people thought they were dangerous because, you know, no one knew what they were for a long time. Like you would, you know, people would maybe, you know, see them, you know, occasionally in the forest um, but no one knew what they were. Um, and that was, you know, that wasn't that long ago that people didn't know what they were. Um, so, uh, sometimes, you know, they would be killed, um, just cause they, you know, they didn't know if they were a threat to their livestock. Obviously people, um, in these areas can be very, you know, like I mentioned, forest dependent They're, you know, there's a lot of poverty. So they're very, um, they're very dependent on their livestock. So they don't want any animals threatening their livestock. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not an expert on, you know, tigers or rhinos, but obviously there is a pretty clear demand for those animals, um, unfortunately. So, you know, obviously with tiger bones, with, um, you know, ivory for rhinos, um, you know, th th those are obviously uh, the reasons why the, these species are, are poached. But with red pandas, again, it's mostly just misinformation now. Um, that, that that's harming them so yeah great question okay uh we've got a few more questions here if you're okay with time terrence yeah definitely how do red pandas compare to other extinct eilerid species in phenotype mm -hmm. and what pressures do you think led to them being the only extant species wow someone's a science major huh that's a great question <laughs> Yeah. Um, so a lot of the, you know, former species of Alertiae are, um, you know, they, they've been extinct for a very long time. I'm not, I'm not even sure how much overlap there, there was between um, the other species and humans, um, if any. So they, they were probably extinct. Um, you know, for other maybe maybe climate reasons, maybe um, competition reasons. I know one of the species is, is called like the short-snouted dog or something like that. Um, it's obviously not a real dog, but it was it's sort of a dog-like tree-dwelling animal that was a carnivore. Um, some Sumatri or I can't remember the the, the Latin name, but um, but it was you know sort of a you know, medium-sized, um, dog-looking, carnivorous, I think they were tree-dwelling. Um, and, and what's interesting about red pandas is that, you know, all of its ancestors were carnivores. I mean, a red panda by, by you know, morphological design um, or, or physical or biological design is a carnivore. You know, it's got the carnivore teeth. Um, you know, I mean, if you see a red panda walk, 
it even has sort of the carnivore like um sort of prowl like you know similar to like a tiger um but they've just adapted to eating bamboo to, you know to being omnivores um while they mostly eat bamboo you know they'll also eat other things um you know obviously you've seen on instagram probably they love grapes um you know they'll eat they'll eat fruit and uh, i've even heard of them you know hunting other animals i don't know how often that'll happen um so they will be you know carnivores when it's needed um but yeah they uh they're basically a carnivore that's adapted to eating mostly bamboo and and maybe the reason is because um you know the other species that weren't able to adapt to such a plentiful plant like bamboo in the, in this area. Maybe that's part of why they went extinct. This is total speculation, but, but um, I mean, there's gotta be a reason why they, they mostly bamboo, right? Again, it's not a nutritious plant. Um, you know, it, it kind of, it becomes a situation where red pandas have to eat a lot, like, you know, throughout the day in order of bamboo in order to, um, you know, get enough bamboo because I think they only digest around like 20% of it. Um, so maybe that sort of, you know, natural selection, red pandas um, were the species that adapted to eating this plant and the other ones didn't, or, you know, I'm not really sure exactly. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. It's it's interesting. They're, they're um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, evolution is... Um, is very fascinating so um this question was touched on earlier but it was regarding uh getting involved in any programs as a student that one can uh experience conservation of red pandas i think you alluded to some of the experiences through red panda network yes yeah, so, sorry what was the question Oh, it was just, uh, I wanted to know if there are any programs that fellow students across the state or country can participate and have in-person experiences with assisting the conservation of red pandas. It, yeah, it depends on, it depends on the age. Um, I mean, so for example, we have a, a program called the Red Panda Ranger Program, and that's for more um, like uh, elementary to middle school and even in high school too, I guess. Um, oh, I gotta plug my computer in, sorry. Um, I thought I did that. But so basically it's a program where people can, um, can you just give me one second? Sorry about that. Sure. Sure. Well, while you do that, Terrence, there's a question on uh, how college students could help with the Greenville Zoo. And we have internship programs and volunteer programs that uh, all that information is available on our website. Uh, <clears throat> it would give an opportunity to work with animals in human care that we have ranging from amphibians up to giraffe, and it includes red pandas, where one could be a keeper assistant potentially. But the best place to learn is that type of volunteering and uh, and then seeing where that leads to, where you can then expand your knowledge and practical experience. I'll let Terrence handle the, the rest of that then. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so we have the Red Panda Ranger program and um, that's, you know, it's it's basically to engage youth in learning about red pandas and telling their friends about red panda conservation. Um, so that's one way you can get involved. And then um, if you're, you know, a little bit older, uh, like in, like, you know, in high school, college um, or post-college, uh, we do have volunteer opportunities. Um, and you can reach out to me um, if you, if you are interested in volunteering, uh, I'd have to look at what opportunities we currently have. Um, but yeah. And then we also, we actually do eco trips. Um, so we, you know, uh, people come to Nepal and they come to the places we work and they see red pandas in the wild. And it's a, it's an amazing experience. I've, I've uh, been on one and, um, yeah, so that, that's a way that you can, um, support red, red panda conservation and actually come see, 
the work we're doing um, to save them. So yeah, recommend that. Okay, we have a a little bit more, a few more questions. If you're okay still with time, Terrence. Yeah, that's fine. In what ways is the Red Panda Network specifically targeting the poaching problem? Um, so basically our approach to poaching is like all of our programs, we work with local people. So what we do is we, um, we organize what are called anti-poaching networks. So we currently have 12, um, in Nepal and these are made up of local people. So for, you know, local stakeholders for red panda conservation. So forest guardians, uh, members of local community groups and um, other people, and they actually go and they monitor the forest. They, um, you know, they report any illegal activity to enforcement agencies. So if they see signs of poaching or if they actually see poachers, um, they'll report them. Um, poachers are arrested, um, you know, because it, it is illegal as, as long as there's enough enforcement to, you know, actually do that. Um, and the anti-poaching networks will actually also, um, they'll dismantle um, you know, snares and traps that have been left by poachers for wildlife. Um, so we do that. And then we also do, um, you know, outreach as well. Uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, Dahong Rai, who, um, is our, you know, conservation ambassador. And so we, you know, we have a, uh, awareness building campaign where we, um, you know, pretty much again, spread, you know, s combat misinformation and, and, um, let people know that, you know, uh, poaching is illegal and it's not worth the risk to uh, poach red pandas. Okay. And uh, got a couple more questions. I'm trying to direct the ones that are more uh, related to range country questions that you're familiar with. Technology is a big thing nowadays and overwhelms many of the younger generation. How can one help impact the younger generation and get them to care about animals? I mean, social media obviously is a is a big um, sort of uh, way that um, people are, you know, connected to wildlife in general. Um, I mean, you know, whether that's wildlife or, or species, uh, wild species or, you know, captive species in zoos. Um, I mean, zoos are obviously a, a very important way for, for people to connect with nature. Um, you know, a lot of the, there's been many red pandas, um, in zoos that have become, you know, sort of, uh, ambassadors, you know, red panda ambassadors for, you know, their, their wild relatives, um, and so, um, and obviously, you know, people take photos, you know, um, zoo social media accounts and all, all this stuff are, I think are really important ways for people to connect with um, and to care about conservation. Okay. And we've got two more questions on um, range country and habitat for you. And then we'll, we'll close on the questions. What species prey upon red pandas besides dogs and certain types of big cats? Yeah, I, I like that you mentioned dogs because actually um, we call them free roaming dogs. So basically, basically dogs in Nepal, um, you know, it's not like dogs here in the States where, you know, people have them on leashes and, and they're like in, you know, enclosed yards usually. Um, you know, dogs are, they're usually, or they're usually like work dogs um, when, you know, when people have them. Um, you know, like herders, like livestock herders will have dogs to help protect their livestock. Um, and these dogs are all like free roaming. And so they'll, um, you know, they'll go into the forest, they'll, they'll hunt. Um, and one of the animals they like to hunt, um, and, you know, sometimes, and some of these dogs are also feral and there's actually like, you know, feral dog packs that will, will hunt. And, um, you know, if there's a red panda that that's, you know, climbed down from a tree that they can become vulnerable to predation by dogs. And actually dogs are one of the, um, sort of most concerning threats to red pandas because um there's a lot of dogs in in these areas and they um they can carry um uh, you know uh, diseases like rabies um the, the canine distemper where actually 
virus will actually kill red pandas. Um, so we have uh, we have programs that um, you know uh, help reduce. So basically, um, uh, we we have programs that help reduce the uh, you know transmission of these diseases, um, and also neutering programs too. So you know so there's not so many uh, free roaming dogs. And then I'll actually answer the question, um, which is that I mean, you know. There probably are uh, animals that, that hunt red pandas. I mean, so, you know, there's not really overlap with snow leopards because um, snow leopards are above the tree line um, in the Himalayas and red pandas are, you know, they live in trees. So they're obviously um, below the tree line. And so I don't know how much snow leopards hunt red pandas. Um, there are clouded leopards and, and, you know, leopards in um in red panda habitat which i'm i'm sure probably would hunt a red panda i've i've never heard of that happening um yellow-throated martins which are you know in the weasel family are um in like eastern nepal for example and and they i think have been documented to hunt red pandas which is interesting because they're smaller than red pandas um kind of significantly smaller but you know uh a lot of animals in the weasel family can, you know, are known to hunt animals that are bigger than them. So, you know, just think of ferrets and, you know, um, minks and things like that. But um, yeah, there's not a lot of natural predators for red pandas. You know, it's mostly humans that unfortunately are contributing to their their decline. So, yeah, uh, that's a great, great answer. It also you know brings out, like you were talking about, some of the disease concerns like rabies and especially canine distemper. That's obviously a, a, a big challenge worldwide in regard to the, the health of ecosystems and and such and uh, just important to mitigate that as much as possible with some of the great work that Red Panda Network is doing with uh, the local communities. I'm sure you you all are educating on some of that aspect and uh, do you, are you doing any vaccination programs I'm with with animal with with domestic dogs in areas of local populations yeah we are yeah we um we hold these um like free you know uh vaccination and and like dog neutering um days for local people who don't usually have access to services like that mm -hmm. um so yeah that's one of the ways that we um that we uh yeah we have these events so that, that's one of the ways that we do that Okay, great. Yeah, um, we've got a number of other questions. I see Terrence uh, has graciously put his email address on the screen. Uh, if we didn't get to one of your questions, uh, Terrence, is it okay for our, our, particip our participants to email you their questions that you didn't get to? Absolutely. Yeah, and I'll try my best to, to answer them. Okay, great. And if you have something that is a question that's more on the uh, the the pandas and human care and sustainability efforts we do in AZA, uh, shoot those questions to me and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. But thank you very much for um, all the great information about Red Panda Network. We've got a lot of enthusiastic people out there that want to do uh, and contribute. And thank you all for, for joining in. Uh, this recording or this this video uh, lecture will be put up as a recording in the future on our website. So uh, stay tuned and check the website. We just need to do a little editing and such to get it on there. So hopefully it'll be there soon. We do have another conservation lecture planned for uh, October. It'll be October 12th on bats. Uh, Jennifer Kendall, who's a bat biologist with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, will talk about bats. We uh, try to do a, or showcase a uh, Halloween-related animal during October. We've got our Boo in the Zoo event later in the month, uh, so we just try to try to have that as a theme. So stay tuned for that uh, information coming up about about the the next lecture. So uh, thanks all for attending and uh, appreciate your interest. And uh, like I said, stay tuned for more information in the future. 
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Appreciate it. Thanks for all the great information, Terrence.